You're watching us place a brand new sand finished patio right over the top of an existing patio that is probably 35 years old and it's broken up. It was ready to be replaced. Now ordinarily this is not good practice. In fact, you should almost never do it because existing concrete will telegraph right up through the bottom of a new pour, whatever its cracking problems are, and in just a short period of time those old cracks are going to appear on the top of the new work and somebody is going to be in a lot, a lot of trouble. But in this case, because of the elevation that I had to work with from raising the height of the new patio, allowing me to get adequate slope so the water can run off to the front of the um, work, would leave two to four inches of distance between the bottom of the new concrete and the top of the old. That distance was taken up with an isolation barrier of road fabric and half inch minus, which was compacted. A heavy rebar section was put in place with smooth dowels located at the control joint location so that when the cracking happened, there would be room for lateral movement. It turned out to be just, I think, a really, really effective way to cover up an old piece of concrete without having to bill the homeowners the considerable amount of money it would have taken to get this stuff out of here and haul it off. Look at these guys use these tools. What they're doing right here is called pulling a wet rod. What that means is one or sometimes both of the ends of the rod are not supported on a form board or a screed. They are only supported by the strength and the steadiness and the judgment of the rod man pulling the rod along in perfect contact with a portion of concrete that has already been floated to grade. There is nothing keeping that rod at the right elevation except the skill of the man who's pulling it. Now think about doing this while you're working at your ankles. Now think about doing this while you're pulling concrete with that rod. Maybe it's 10 pounds of concrete. Maybe it's 30 pounds of concrete. Maybe you've got a an inexperienced mud cutter or an apprentice or somebody or maybe a homeowner who thinks he's going to be helpful and he's getting behind on cutting the mud and you're dragging 60 or 80 pounds of concrete on a wet rod. You got a problem. These guys never have a problem. They are seamless and their product is flat and it looks great when they're done. Concrete is the material on a job site with the largest set of variables, any of which can in fact wreck the whole project if not understood and dealt with properly. Now these guys, Dustin, Tom, and Rich are terrific. Not only do they handle these variables, but they make it look easy and they approach decorative concrete work as if they were doing auto body work. Can't beat that. Forming concrete Setting up concrete is carpentry, isn't it? It has much more in common with framing than pouring. And if you have the tools and you can build things and you understand the slopes that you need to move the water off of your concrete, if you understand the strength that it will need to have to withstand the hydraulic form pressures that will be generated, if you understand the timing of removing the forms and how that will work, go ahead and set it up. But don't make the mistake of thinking this qualifies you to place and finish or pour the concrete itself. When the truck gets there and the mud gets into the site, time becomes your mortal enemy. You've got to get it in place and in shape now. 
This brings up the advantage of using a concrete pump. A concrete pump gets it in place. You don't break any sewer lines or tear the eaves off of any houses or bend any rebar or knock any forms out of a line with a truck by pouring as often happens when you pour out of the chute. You put the exact amount of mud you need exactly where you need it in short order and so from my perspective a pump is almost always money well spent. Now beyond that, beyond the challenge of getting it in place fast, you've got to understand, you've got to understand the timing of what happens next. You've got to understand how to rot it and get everything into the planes that you want. You've got to understand the timing of floating it off, the timing of sealing it up, of cutting the joints, of when to trowel or when to stamp or when to broom or when to put the retarder on or when to expose the aggregate. Because with concrete, as with so much else, in fact, more than with almost anything else, timing is everything. You've got to understand when it's ready to strip and face if you've got to pull off some vertical expose some vertical faces. If you wait too long, it's too hard. If you do it too soon, it falls down. Now, if you don't feel comfortable with this, and frankly, most people don't, then do yourself a favor and make your first attempt at placing and finishing your own concrete in the backyard, please. And if you decide to hire a finisher, which is a good way to learn how to finish concrete, isn't it? Make sure he sees the site when you think you are ready and a day or two before the concrete's going to show up because he is undoubtedly going to have some objections or at least some suggestions about what you need to do before the truck gets there. Sand finished concrete is first cousin to exposed aggregate concrete. Both of them depend on killing the chemical reaction at the surface. Sand finish, you kill it about a sixteenth of an inch deep. Exposed aggregate, you kill it a little deeper, maybe an eighth, maybe three sixteenths. And this is regulated in different ways. But the concept is you get your concrete in place, you float it, you seal it up, you cut the joints, you wipe out the lines, and when it's just about as hard as the back of your hand, you hit it with a surface retarder. Now the surface retarder does not have to be store-bought. You can use sugar water, you can use molasses water, but I've gotten to where I like to use a store-bought. Sand finish is so terrific. It's authentic. You know it's concrete. It's not posing as something else. It feels good underfoot. It's slip resistant. It cleans up easy and it matches older work. So after the retarder's on there, and once it gets hard enough to walk on without really tearing it up, out you go with your pressure washer. And you carefully, oh so carefully, wash the paste, the cream, the small grains of sand off of the top. Here's what you don't do, is let the hose of your pressure washer vibrate a line into the work behind you, so you keep that up off the work and clean it up. A couple, three days later, it'll be dry. Then you acid wash it to get rid of the salts and the alkalize, then you seal it, then you enjoy it. Just a note about Dustin, Tom, and Rich. They're terrific. Took me years to find them. And I never intend to use anybody else to pour concrete on any of the work that I do around here. Thanks, guys.